can't do podiums. <laughs> Although I might fall off the stage um, and kick the uh, confidence monitor. Um, thank you for the warm welcome. I appreciate that. I uh, have a handful of slides. I'll try to get through them you know, relatively quickly, leave time for some questions at the end if we have those. Um, but, but basically, we say delivering our brand promise. And um, I will say, uh, yes, you know, we are based in Boston and, and seen as a, a Boston brand. And maybe some of you saw The Tonight Show last night and, and are familiar with a report was published recently about the sexiest accents in America. And Boston was named number two, which is great. I'm kind of bummed out. I, I, Grew up in Connecticut, so I don't really have the Boston accent, so it's not going to help me too much. But um, on the Tonight Show last night, they did a bit about what's inherently Boston and immediately went into a bit holding a Dunkin' Cup. Certainly, you've seen us on Saturday Night Live. So uh, we do get a lot of love out there. Um, but it, what it all boils down to is our brand promise is simply uh, America runs on Dunkin' by us delivering great coffee fast. It's as simple as that. I love simplicity. Um, at first, I was questioning why I was put on. Uh, we had the burger guys talk during breakfast, and now we have the breakfast guy talking during burger time. But uh, it actually makes brilliant sense because uh, I, my presentation today, if you can take anything away from it, I, I enjoy simplicity. I enjoy speed. I enjoy putting things in a way that's simple to understand, relatable, and understandable, and that everyone can action around. We have so many franchisees, field team, and we need simplicity that everyone can march around. Once everything starts going off the rails, that's when things go bad. So with that, I want to set some expectations. I did not bring any of this. So for those of you that were hoping to get some harpoon beer, that's not going to happen. Uh, I also didn't bring any of this, uh, so you're going to have to wait for your happy hour uh, and get your, get your beer somewhere else. But please make sure you go out and get our, our collaboration with Harpoon. Um, I also can't get you a pair of these. Uh, great, great partnership uh, with Saucony this year, uh, our run shoes, sold out in a week. So uh, unless you're about a size 6 or a size 18, I'm not sure that we have any left that will work. Um, but. The reason why I show those things, though, is that those are important simp simplistic partnerships to show our brand is a part of your everyday life. America runs on Dunkin'. We have running shoes. We have things you love outside of how our coffee fits into daily life. But one of the things I, that I abhor is overcomplication of things. And you know, I have this kind of thing. People come and send like all these kind of marketing type uh, talk, and you know, I hear this. Data-driven driven decisions designed to maximize content exposure that is platform agnostic with high engagement score. It's really just an awful way of saying, hey, you guys want to hang out? And, I, and I, that's kind of the way that we try to think about things as far as our marketing is what can we do that's very simple for people to understand and makes people want to be more involved with us. Because who wants more of this? We always say in the QSR business, I want more traffic. It's not really the right way to talk about it. Traffic is not pleasant. I could date myself with this reference a little bit, but uh, for some laughs, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you uh, a little younger, this is a Major League Baseball pitcher, Randy Johnson, tallest pitcher to uh, ever play in the Major League, six foot ten. His nickname was the Big Unit. So uh, people go to the ballpark and love it when they could see the Big Unit, but. No one ever walks into a QSR and asks if they can have a unit of coffee. So the, the language that we use really matters um, because they're not traffic. They're guests, not ordering units. They're ordering something they love. So we need to talk the way that they talk if we want to make a real connection with them. And yes, I did. I, by the way, I made this presentation days ago. I didn't realize the Jets were going to do more Jets-like things, and I'm not trying to just troll everybody with my picture of Rob Gronkowski, but uh, I did have to, of course, put that in there being a uh, Boston-based guy. So I want to give you sort of, I boiled this down to kind of hopefully three easy steps of how we think about how to treat our guests. The first and most important thing that we try to think about uh, for, our, uh, for Duncan is to be able to speak the consumer's language. So as was mentioned, and many of you know, the first thing is, why don't we just call ourselves what everybody calls us? Uh, we're just Duncan. Uh, you know, we have a last name, a last name that actually denotes the kind of products we sell. But like all of us have last names, people call us by our first name. It doesn't mean we're no longer a part of the family that's our last name. So we just made the simple decision to say, why don't we just call ourselves Duncan? 
and it worked out pretty well. Uh, it delivered the most coverage in brand history last year. Uh, many uh, publications wrote about us. It obviously, we could go over and crank up the social engine machine over there, and you can see it generated a lot of chatter online. Uh, it was a hugely successful move for the brand based on a consumer insight around how people thought of us and how people thought about delivering, going to restaurants in general. The other thing, and, and we kind of saw this earlier, so I guess I'm just sort of piling on to uh, the theme that you've been hearing a lot about today, is how do we make it about the customer? So this is a simple example real quickly of um, this past March, we brought back our Irish cream flavor. We hadn't done the Irish cream flavor in a few years, and we went back, and, and again, we saw an example of this before with uh, uh, the 10-year the uh, program that was done. We did our own little back-in-time program. When we stopped doing it, people like tweeted, what the hell, Duncan, where's my Irish cream? So we went back and found tweets that were four years old and said, hey, we're back. You still there? Uh, and consumers love this. This is personalization. This is the kind of things that people talk about. So it was something fun, something simple for us to do, but it doesn't have a lot of scale to it. So there's other examples we need to come up with where how can we drive more uh, customers into the restaurant? How do we listen to them? What are they looking for? Well, they're looking for espresso. And I put this example up here to show you this is the uh, iced and hot espresso, the, the, the bottom line is iced, the top line is hot espresso, uh, cups sold in the U.S. in billions uh, per year. The reason why only Starbucks is up there is because the rest of us are somewhere like basically on that bottom line, and if I put it up there, you wouldn't be able to see us. They're far and away leading the category, and we need to do something to make that work, to, to get our fair share. And the truth is, what we really need to do is just improve the quality of our espresso and make people like it. So we did that. And we made a $100 million investment last year. We went into over 9,200 restaurants and made and put in, installed brand new espresso equipment. It also improved the overall, what we call TDS, total dissolved solids, that went into uh, the espresso to make it a real rich experience. Now, what I just said, could you imagine a consumer even giving a shit about any of that? So how do you launch this in a way that is not boring? Because I have a great, um, Marty St. George is a um, CMO for JetBlue, is a former client of mine. I always said, the minute you start explaining as a marketer is the minute you start dying. So we can't explain, and I don't want to have to go out and apologize for what I was delivering before. So how do we figure this out? Domino's worked that out, good for them. But that was not a strategy we wanted. So we simply went out there with a nice tagline of sipping is believing. And it's really kind of a brilliant wink and nod to give it a try. You're going to like it. Now, the reality is, is that, OK, we did put a price point on it. We had to do some things that are large traffic driving platforms. But how do we get this in people's hands in a way that's very Duncan, very accessible? It makes us look like we've gone the extra step to think about your life and how does our espresso fit into your life? Not any espresso, but how does a Duncan espresso fit into your life? So we made a series of fun little videos. And hopefully this will work. And I'll play one for you now. Walking around in my cappuccinos. Now I can hold my coffee in my throat. Free to go about my business wherever I go with my Duncan cappuccino and my cappuccinos. So the point of why I show that, look, there's a whole series of things we did as far as data and who is our core customer and what are the platforms we're going to deliver that on. But that's a way to look accessible and approachable. At the end of the day, you have to live the brand promise that you are making. The second thing, and this is obviously fairly uh, obvious, is we have to go to places that they like to go. So forgive me for a moment. We're going to get a little geeky here with some media charts, uh, but and nothing too earth shattering, but important to set the stage. We all know uh, we are now in the golden age of two years into where the amount of time consumers are spending per day on digitally connected devices is greater than non-digital connected devices. So digital is becoming hugely important to how we think about how we reach our consumers. We've seen a lot of it today, screen agnostic, buying uh, media, uh, video on phones. So we all know this is really important. Whoops. Back up for a second here if I can. There we one more. OK. Um, another way I like to think about this, I like to think about how is technology uh, changing people's lives is the rate of technology uh, adoption is really important. So I like to show this chart, and I show it in a lot of meetings with our franchisees, is to think about the importance of smartphones. I want to show a couple of things on this chart. 
The two farthest lines to the right you see there are the telephone, 100, uh, and then 49 years for the television. This is telling you the number of years before we had globally had a billion users of that product. So it's kind of amazing to think about the television being an omnipresent device in everybody's home, but it took almost 50 years to have a billion people in the world actually have a television set. And you go all the way over to the left, it took eight years for everyone to have for a billion smartphones in their hands. Not mobile phones, smartphones. So when you think about that, there is not time. Like you think of television, we've crafted years, and you take six months and do focus group tests, and you do all this stuff. That doesn't exist. Smartphones are here. They're in our world. How do we think about that? We need to use them every single day as marketers, and we can't be afraid and wait for someone else to do it. We have to do it first. So a couple of ways I just real quick want to think about that, and shout out to our partners at Waze that are here, obviously in our QSR business. They're great partners to all of us. Um, but it's, we know so much. The phone is telling us so much. And, and we talked a lot about first party data. This is just available. This is almost no party data. It's just basically knowing that person's holding their phone, what's, what, where are they and what's going on in their life. This is just showing an example of uh, a time and schedule. So obviously we are a brand that is skewed to the morning. If I know it's in the morning and I know that you're on your way to work, right? I can offer you an opportunity to pick up breakfast, okay? More than that, whoops, more than that. So in the middle, you kind of see that's a simple zero speed takeover. I'm sure many of you have done them for your clients before. But what's really great about it is now we're starting to see things like let's do order integration right into Waze. So you can actually click on the pin. Uh, it'll actually tell you where the Duncan location, if you need to know. A lot of people don't. They already know where they're going, but it'll give, direct you right there. And you can order ahead through the app. And when you're there, your product is waiting for you. There are simple things about knowing where you are, knowing where you're going, knowing what you're looking for, and giving you something fast and easy makes a big difference in people's lives. The other thing, we, uh, sort of going back to the left, I mean, weather. Weather is a huge uh, issue for all of our lives. Weather and rain in particular impacts our business more than anything else out there. Um, People don't want to get out of their cars. They're running late for work. The traffic is bad. Uh, so when it rains, we have a lot of uh, difficulty with that. So one of the things that we need to do is come up with what are some solutions outside of delivery? And you know, we talked before about delivery is its own set of animals with, as Bear Burger pointed out, as far as third party and giving up control of that. But outside of that and running things out to the curb, what can we do? Simply offering the right products you know, to, to get people over the hump. So in the morning, people love Dunkin'. They're going to get a cup of coffee. It's raining. I don't want to stop. What can we do when we know it's raining to give them a little extra incentive beyond just a discount? So we've been able to leverage now our new espresso platform. It's a bit more, we've learned through research, a latte is a little bit more of a comfort drink, particularly when it's cold and rainy. So if we're supposed to be on a promotion one month about a breakfast sandwich, but it's raining in New York that day, let's actually dynamically switch out that ad and run and make sure that we offer them an opportunity for our espresso product. So these are important, simple things that we've started to do with the brand that actually are a little bit more responsive to what is going on in a consumer's life that doesn't even require real first party data. So the last thing I want to kind of talk about is this, I, this notion of make sure you're useful. Have a purpose, all right? A lot of this, as I've just shown you, is there are great opportunities for us to become a part of a person's uh, media experience, but there are times where we are still stuck interrupting an experience. So how do we, if we are interrupting you, how do we make it worth your while? We really need to think that way. Uh, let's see if this works. Um, this is an example of a, a partnership we did with Instagram. The video that's playing right now is before CES, and Sheryl Sandberg actually was getting ready for um, talking about all the great technologies that were going out, coming out of Instagram, and we were fortunate, uh, unbeknownst to us, she highlighted a partnership that we had done with her uh, last summer, and it was a perfect storm where uh, we were launching our donut fries last summer, and Instagram was launching their polling ad. So it was a great opportunity for us to talk about do you like your donuts as regular donuts? Do you like your donuts as donut fries? Uh, and it gave people a purpose for what they were voting for and why they were voting. And this ad actually received more engagement. And our uh, two-week trial rate on donut fries was the highest existing trial rate of any product in the history of the company. And we didn't do much more than the Instagram either. Uh, we, did so we basically launched this program last July, less than a million dollars. 
nationally, and more of it went to Instagram than our other partners. So it was a hugely successful uh, program, and to let everybody know, we don't have to do huge TV campaigns for everything that we launch. Another thing, and this is you know, perhaps overly simple, is thinking about, again, environment and where you are, is you know, we're obviously, we partner with the Boston Red Sox, so rather than say we're the official coffee, if, we're, if, if you know, America runs on Duncan, then Boston should run on Duncan. This particular ad has now been updated where we have logo rights and marks is the Red Sox run on Duncan. So you see a lot more of that, and thanks to our partners at BBDO that are here, wrote some great lines for us to actually take advantage of where, where there's localization, where we know we can actually stand out a little bit more. So context and content really do matter, and I think we tend to kind of push uh, push past that a little too quickly sometimes, and we also expect third-party machinery or, or machine learning to do this for us, but sometimes this is, these are things we have to think about uh, purposefully as we're planning our media. This is an example. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to play this clip, and I'll talk about it after. And we've had definitely more icings. Two minutes. Hey, Pasta, large bowl group. Better make it a medium. I only have two minutes. Hey, Rick, check your wife now. We missed some calls. Where there's hockey, there's Duncan. So grab a cold brew for game time. He only has 30 penalty minutes on the season, but if you count them up on the NBC broadcast, <laughs> he might lead the league. <laughs> we got him in twice the other night on Wednesday night. It's a double minor, I believe. When it's such a good commercial, you just have to show it. <laughs> The Geyser's Rochelle went off the skate of Mackable. And it comes to Madison Valley. All right. So, yes, we buy advertising with NBC Sports. But I really don't believe when, some, when an announcer who's up there is thinking that when he says, that's just a really great commercial. Um, do we spend the most money on NHL with any partner? No, not by a long shot. What we do is we worked with our partners. We came up with something that was integrated into the game. We only ran it during the game, which is this double box unit, which is relatively unique to hockey. Uh, and we, we bought just that unit, just, when we, just at this time. This was literally, this game um, was less than three weeks into the campaign. So it's not like this thing took cut in for years for us. Just the other, last Thursday night, uh, and I'm a hockey fan, so I was watching the Bruins were playing on Thursday evening um, against Carolina in game one, and it was halfway through the third period, and, and our, our friend David Posternock uh, was uh, high-sticked, and there was no call for it. So he skated uh, through center ice, and they did a close-up shot of him, seeing if he was bleeding or not. And the announcer in the game actually repeated the line from our spot while the game was going on. Hey, ref, check your voicemail. You missed some calls. We didn't even run a spot in that game, and they talked about us for 30 seconds. So it's really been a great opportunity of just a simple way of, hey, commercials interrupt game experiences. How can we take something that NBC is trying to make a little bit more palpable for the audience, but also give them something that's actually entertaining and part of the game? Little things matter. Simple things matter. So is all of this working? Well, all right, let's look at one measure. and. Thank you to our YouGov partners that are here. Uh, one of the things that we're really proud of is, given our history, for those of you that don't know, Duncan started in Quincy, Massachusetts in 1950. So like a lot of brands today, we are in now our real second generation of consumers. There's a whole generation of consumers my age and a little bit older that grew up with it, that love it, but there's a younger generation that don't necessarily grow up with drip coffee the way that I did. So we now need to attract those. So this is really important to us. So being the number one uh, gaining brand with uh, youth culture was really important to us. Name change. Right? Simple things that I showed you leading to this. Uh, we mentioned before, so QSR Magazine actually named us the most transformational brand for 2018. Now, I wouldn't call us the most technologically driven advanced brand. We have a great app. We give a good experience. But we're not, you know, I was just having a conversation with everyone before coming up to us. How are you using data? I was like, man, I, you know. I've been here a year. I'm like, that's next year's problem. I got to figure that one out. Um, but we're not the most technologically advanced company. But these simple things give the perception of that we actually are, right? And we are there for consumers, and con we give consumers everything that they need. Traffic, right? We turned that negative word of traffic, right? We turned it into a positive. So. Uh, cars are swiping right. As you, I chose this picture for a reason. It was shot out of the back of a car. Someone's pulling into the, to the Duncan. Uh, those of you that um, 
follow the uh, investor calls uh, first quarter. We had the best first quarter uh, this year uh, in over three and a half years uh, as far as turning around uh, negative visits and, and becoming a positive. So you see we had a near 5% lift in our overall visits and our sales comps are up. Uh, we don't talk a little bit about, it's funny, um, in the industry, People have sales comps are up, and, and our, some of our burger chain friends, they have a, a much higher uh, ticket when people come in. They're buying full dinner. For us, we have almost 60% of our business is, or eh, maybe a little less than that, um, probably 60% of our business is coffee. Of that, probably another 50% of that is just people coming in and just buying a coffee. They don't buy anything else. So our average ticket all right, is a much lower than our competitors. So we, don't, we can't take price and other things to help drive our sales comps. When our sales comps are up, it's because our traffic is better. So if you take away anything from this conversation today, we just want to kind of boil this down to its most simplistic terms. Using terms like traffic, bad. Brand love is good. So simple, using the right language, using the right tools at the right time, actually does more than we think, okay? That's it. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, questions, I've got one question. Um, you're, you're, the ads that you showed here are, are relatively local, like Monster Green. Uh, I mean, people in, in Boston know that, that Fenway Park, it's the green monster, but people out of town don't. As you scale, which you obviously are, can you maintain that on a, on a much larger scale, or are you going to stay local everywhere? Yeah, no, I, I think we actually, um, we're doing that, uh, that particular campaign as part of our Boston Proud initiative, um, but we're going to pilot that in other cities. Uh, we'll do a little bit of it in New York, Philadelphia. So like one example, so New York, for anybody who's Giants fans, uh, when we launched the Espresso platform, we actually worked locally and did a local activation with Saquon Barkley, uh, who's actually a wonderful espresso uh, lover, and we did a whole campaign just rooted around him. So I think you know, it's a little extra work to do these local uh, activations and localization, um, but they're important and they go a long way. So yes, we can scale them and we will continue to. Other questions? How you doing? My name is Harrison Dunn. I'm from a worldwide platform called Think Near. Uh, my question for you is that you know you talked about a lot about innovative, simple ideas. If you have something that's thoughtful and innovative, what is the best way to bring that to your attention? Understanding all the dynamics that you're having to deal with in terms of agency relationships, agency communication, and then just the simple fact of the thousands and thousands of emails that you get. <laughs> How is someone to get their idea in front of you if it's thoughtful and innovative? What's yeah. the best way to do that? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I'll leave platform out of it. I mean, email is still a useful tool. Forget about the platform for a second, though. I think two things, and one, that's why I started, uh, I think about my fourth slide in, I, I talked about, I had, you know, this marketing jargon about engage, you know, data technologies to drive engagement and consumer satisfaction, you know, which is like, hey, I just want people to come to my restaurant. So I do, I will say in the year that I've been here, and even before that, you know, I, I think, you know, simply stating, hey, this is what my platform does and what it can do for you, which is kind of an obvious answer. But the more important thing is, and you know, I want to get out and talk about our business, talk about our brand, talk about what we are, but if you understand our business and our business challenges and what we're trying to do, that goes a long way. Hey, I saw you, you know, I, I saw that you're doing this Boston Proud campaign. You know, I have a great local uh, technology platform that can help you cons consolidate data and know where people are in neighborhoods in Boston. Like, those are the things that I think we react to the most. And, you know, I, I you know, I'm staring at a lot of faces in this room that are probably, Keith, I've sent you a lot of emails and I haven't heard back from you. <laughs> And, you know, I did, I started my career and I got great advice and it was make sure you respond to everything you get, even if you're not interested, just to say, hey, now's not a good time or whatever. And I, I try my best, but it does get away from you to your point. But uh, what we do try to do is the ones that are thoughtful about, hey, I know what you're trying to do. I have something that's interesting that I think could help you then we tend to actually either someone from the team t tends to follow up on those, or of course we have agency partners as well. But I think it starts with um, we tend to use 
too many generalizations. There's too many partners out there that, that are, you know, I can do it all, which is, you probably can. But here's what I can do that I think would help your business challenge. Me personally, that's what I react to a little bit more. Again, I'm into simplicity. It's, it's a defense mechanism because I'm not that bright. Hi, Jen Jones, guest buddy we just met. Um, curious, when you're talking about business challenges, how are you as a QSR looking at the threat of C stores and their growth of food service? Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, getting back to the question before about regionalization, that's why regionalization is so important because it depends on where you are. For I, I met someone earlier from Philadelphia, and I'm sure uh, they would sit there and talk about uh, going to Wawa. And, you know, Wawa actually has more uh, original blends right now than Duncan does. Um, and I won't get into the boring details of why that is and high volume brewers and so forth, but the fact is they do offer more varieties and they offer a great cup of coffee. And it's a very low percent of their overall mix, so they can sell it cheaply because they make money on other things. Uh, so yeah, it is a real competitive threat. Um, I think what you saw today is like, I think our way of combating that, okay, is obviously having a great variety of products. Obviously, it's, you know, it's not, a, you know, you get it served for you. I think one of the things that we've done to combat that is one of the things that we gave away to the C stores, and we, we kind of saw this a little bit earlier, and you, we, someone talked about McDonald's and kiosk ordering, is, you know, the, the, the getting it wrong rate, you know, particularly as we expand outside of our core northeast, crew comes in and they, they don't quite get your cup of coffee right. So then the, the C stores become a more, bigger competitive threat because now, I'll do it myself. I can. I know exactly how I want my coffee. Um, but now we have things like order labels, okay? Which um, is, you know, we talked a lot kiosks. Kiosks are kind of interesting. You know, our experience with them is that they, they don't save anything on labor. It's just a different kind of labor because now you have to send people out, tell people how to use the kiosk. And for a restaurant like ours that relies on speed, kiosks slow you down. So that doesn't really work for us. So we need mobile order ahead, and we also need uh, order labels. So we don't want to, you know, I, met, I was going to have a joke before about Starbucks, about the word traffic. Like, how, like Starbucks, like how many people have gone to Starbucks and they spelled or got your name wrong on the cup, right? Probably half the room, right? Well, the order labels take care of that, right? So we get our order rate right. We get a great cup of coffee. Someone serves it for you, right? That's a way, that's an experience now that combats a, uh, a C store, which isn't really offering as much of an experience. The other thing, I won't get into a whole thing about, you know, um, the different business models that we have, um, but there are other ways that those C stores make money that are very regional and don't necessarily scale as well. Um, so for us, I would say in the Northeast, yes, we worry about it a little bit more, but it doesn't have as big an effect on our overall national business. Hi, Melissa Keyless with Verizon Media. Um, we're hearing a lot about how delivery is disrupting the QSR space. How do you see that translate to your business coffee delivery? Um, and is it something that you guys are looking to, to focus on? Yes, and since we're in New York, I will offer up to all of you, we have a partnership with Seamless in New York, so make sure that you get Dunkin' delivered to your office. The Dunkin' Run now doesn't require actual running by you. Um, yeah, it's hugely important to our business model. Um, I think particularly, like I said, in certain markets like New York, uh, which is, by the way, we, we're a Boston-based company, but New York, given its size, is our number one market. Um, so, and it's a very urban-based market with the food delivery service. So it's going to be hugely important there. Uh, I think it's, it's also uh, a big part of growing our afternoon business. So it's really important, but it was brought up before. The margins and how the cost works is really important because I've mentioned before, our check size isn't that great. So passing along the cost of delivery is a challenge for us. Oh, uh, hi, Keith. Uh, Jazz with Hollywood Branded. Um, I've sent you a lot of emails, and you haven't gotten back to me. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I have a weird filter on my email, and <laughs> the, the word jazz, I think, somehow gets filtered out. I'll change it to rock. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, two parts to this question. One, how important is product placement and uh, branded content partnerships for Dunkin' and its brands? And two, uh, being uh, in coffee, what are your thoughts on the recent uh, accidental product placement in Game of Thrones? And... Uh, the exposure Starbucks has gotten from it, even though it wasn't even a Starbucks cup. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, those lucky uh, sort of happenstance. I, you know, here's the thing on product placement. You know, it's kind of interesting. I, I 
we're fortunate to have, we, we feed our brand with great content and great placements that forces people to talk about us. Um, so we don't pay for it as much as others do. So I don't see it as that important of a role as far as paying to have people um, um, drinking our coffee. And the other main reason for that is I think those, those are great mechanisms to help drive awareness. We don't have an awareness issue. We just have a consideration issue. So I actually, in, in that case, product placement doesn't play as big a role for us as it might for some other brands. And yeah, I would, uh, yeah, I would have loved it if Game of Thrones had had a Dunkin' Cup in there by accident. But we'll, we'll get, we, well, I'll take the Tonight Show last night spending 30 seconds holding a, Jimmy Fallon holding a Dunkin' Cup talking about Dunkin'. Keith Lesby, thank you very much. Thank you.